This is the 13th in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In this lecture, we want to slice up a manifold into little thin slices like salami. So consider um, a simple example. If you take the plane um, and you draw lines parallel to, a, all the lines parallel to a given line. Now, if you were to move every point over by a translation, any translation will take a parallel, that, that line to a parallel line. So it preserves that family of lines. When we translate, we take that family of lines to itself. And it doesn't matter if we translate horizontally or vertically or in any direction, that family of lines remains, uh, remains unchanged, uh, each line being sl sliding over to another one uh, that's parallel to it. So the collection of all those lines is invariant under translation. And recall that if we translate the plane by uh, one unit this way, uh, by one unit this way, we end up with a torus as a quotient, right? The torus is, um, uh, the two-dimensional two torus is the quotient of the plane by the group generated by um, xy goes to x plus 1y and xy goes to xy plus 1. So, um, or in other words, you could say it's just simply r2 mod z2. Since the lines are invariant under those transformations, they're taken to one another, they actually quotient down to a, to a, a picture of the, of the torus having such lines drawn on it. And when you go off this guy, you come back on one unit down, this guy. When you go off at this point, you come back on here, and one unit over this way, you come off here, and you come back down one unit here, and so on and so forth. And um, I'll leave you to convince yourself that um, uh, the um, orbits are uh, uh, dense uh, if and only if, let's say, all these uh, the images of these, these lines are dense. Each one is dense if and only if uh, the slope is irrational. So you take a line of irrational slope, you look at all of its parallel lines, and then every single one of them is dense in the entire torus. And a kind of more torus-like picture, more uh, familiar picture, what we're imagining is something that winds uh, around, comes around, and then winds around again, and so on. And if you keep going and going, you come back, not quite back to where you started. Um, if it's an irrational slope, you come back again. It's just a little bit off from where you started, and then you start all over again and come back a little bit off from where you started again, and so on. So you get this kind of picture of dense winding um, of, 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 a, of a curve around the torus. Al algebraically, I want to think about how we would glue together things so that they fit. In our example, we had uh, that the lines, the parallel lines, when we translated, remained the same lines. What I want to imagine is having some kind of picture of some open set in the plane, uh, and I imagine drawing the horizontal lines across it, just in this case horizontal lines to make the picture simpler. And I want to imagine what happens if we carry out some diffeomorphism, but we ask that the horizontal lines be always remain horizontal. So in, in our previous example, we had not necessarily horizontal lines, but let's just, for simplicity, take the example with horizontal lines of region of the plane. So what happens if we take, let's say, two, uh, two connected regions and we have diffeomorphism between them, and it takes horizontal lines to horizontal lines. So it's going to take points x, y, goes to points, let's say, u, v, uh, where it's u is u of x, y, and v is v of x, y, are new variables in terms of old ones, some diffeomorphism. When will it match horizontal lines to horizontal lines? Well, the horizontal lines are the lines y equals constant, and so they have to map to lines uh, v equals constant if we're going to make them become horizontal still. So that has to be the case if and only if that's the case. In other words, um, it has to be that constant y gives constant v. So if I plug in a constant y in here, there can't be any x dependence. And so that's exactly saying that v has to be v of y. And so we end up with a, with a collection of, of transformations that look like x, y goes to u of x, y could be essentially anything as long as this ends up being a diffeomorphism, but v has to be v of y only. Um, and these are the kinds of transformations we're, that are going to preserve the, the, the notion of, of something being a horizontal line. So um, we can generalize that to any number of dimensions and just say that a, 
um, if we have, uh, let's say, uh, some u open subset of R p plus q, and we have some w open subset of R p plus q, and we have some map, let's say that a map phi takes u to w is um, said to be p foliated or something like that. Uh, if um, uh, we have, uh, let's say, u v equals phi of uh, x y as um, u equals u of x y anything and v equals v of y only. So in other words, it takes constant, um, and I suppose I should just to be careful, maybe make them both be connected um, because if they're not connected, it's more, much more complicated, let's say connected open sets. Um, and so these are what we'll call p-foliated maps. Um, they'll take constants to constants. And then um, a, um, uh, a p-foliation uh, atlas, atlas uh, on a manifold um, m, let's say dimension m equals p plus q, um, is just a, is an atlas is an atlas whose transition maps are p foliated so um so they're they're maps that to take horizontal to horizontal so you have this kind of picture of uh, the diffeomorphism but that takes horizontal strips to horizontal strips. And that way, it'll make sure that they glue together to take this pi kind of picture to this kind of picture on, on overlaps, right? There's some sort of overlap um, region and some overlap region that are tied together by this kind of diffeomorphism that preserves these horizontal strips going to horizontal strips. Then, um, of course, if you have a, a, an atlas and I have an atlas, they, we want to know if they're the same. So a p uh, defoliation or just a foliation um, is a maximal um, uh, p foliation atlas. So that way we forget uh, the, the specific choice of atlas and we really just keep track of how the how the manifold has its smooth structure and how it's how it's uh, got these little those little foliations of it. A, um, the picture here gives us what we want to think about a um, when we have so one of these charts, it's going to identify uh, these sets like this, a uh, plaque um, is a submanifold, uh, let's say, uh, P contained in M, M on our manifold. So we have some atlas on some manifold M, we have some foliation on M, um, identified by some chart some chart from our atlas, obviously we're only going to take them from our p foliation atlas, um, with uh, uh, some set of points where somewhere the coordinates are constant for one of the, for those of the variables, right, um, in RQ. So it's going to make various of the variables be constant and make us be in one of these little strips according to the, to that chart. And obviously um, the intersection of plaques is a plaque. Um, but these plaques aren't the really interesting things we care about. What we really care about is the big picture. So rather than thinking about the plaques, what we're really interested in are what we call the leaves, which are the really interesting objects. Um, the plaques are little bits of, of something larger. Um, a, um, a leaf is a maximal uh, connected union of plaques, plaques, I should say path connected, union of plaques. So, um, so the idea in our torus example is that the, um, that these, these little, uh, these lines in the plane quotient to things on the torus um, when we quotient the sides together and this, as we go off this side comes back on, I don't know, it comes back on this side over here, it goes off that side and so on and so forth. So we go on and on winding around the place. Um, the, the object that, that's the leaf, so the plaque is one of these little little pieces of the, of the story, but the leaf might actually be this densely winding object. So the leaves um, are, uh, since they're locally made of plaques, they're, uh, they're submanifolds. 
but they're usually not. Typically, they're not. Um, they're not embedded, not necessarily embedded. The plaques, by definition, are embedded, and they sit inside the leaves. But the leaves could be much worse. As a sort of trivial example of this of the the story, if you have some map, uh, some um, uh, map which is let's say a so there's a submersion. So remember that meant that uh, that phi prime at any point uh, take the tangent space to the tangent space here and was onto was an onto linear map. Um, derivative is an onto linear map that's the definition of submersion then um, then you can um, you can simply de declare um, to uh, do the, the you know we know that in coordinates there are uh, coordinates in which the black map just looks like a linear projection so you can simply look at the at the leaves at the being the, the fibers of this map so we can let um, so there exists a foliation um, say F or script F or something like that whose leaves are uh, the uh, components, the path components, of uh, the fibers uh, phi inverse of a single point. So you could take a point here and look at the fiber over it as a leaf, point here is the fiber over the leaf. And this is a ter trivial example of a, of a foliation. So we could have some, some object that's some p, and to some q, we're mapping points down to points, and we find that we get these, this sort of pre-images. They might not be connected. Um, maybe some of them are connected, some of them are not. So that's a, uh, sorry, the camera's off. Okay, so um, so we might have some p like this, maybe with holes in it, and it maps submersively to some q, and then uh, each point in q has pre-image some fiber, which is a submanifold, and they lay out neatly by the by the implicit function theorem. The implicit function theorem uh, said that if we have a submersion, we can locally find uh, coordinates. Say, let's say these are say, x's and these are y's, and this guy maps down to uh, just to the x's, and so these these are the leaves. Uh, my previous picture of leaves was horizontal. Now I'm drawing them vertically, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so we can we can think of these as the leaves in this case. So this is a is a boring example. It's boring because there actually is a very nice a way to parameterize the different choices of leaves. The leaves aren't horribly dense. They aren't badly behaved. In fact, in this case, they're actually embedded submanifolds. In in the notes, I, I give explicit um, formulas for the so-called Reeb foliation, but I, I don't want to do that through formulas here because they're not particularly revealing. Maybe um, let's just draw some pictures of of a nice example. Of a foliation, we start off with a picture which is just a just a sort of cup. Um, actually, it should be infinitely tall and get skin, skinnier and skinnier so that it sits inside a cylinder. So we could actually create a cylinder and then this cup, and the cup is going to become asymptotic to the cylinder as it goes up higher and higher. Um, so as we go up here, this this cup is actually this this. It's not a parabola. It's something more like a like a graph, a rotated graph of some kind of of the trig function that explodes or something like this that explodes up, up, up here. So it gets really, really close to the sides of this. Now, not just let's just not have one cup. Let's have several. Um, so we take a cup and then we put it inside another cup. And we put that inside another cup. And we stack them up um, so that they're stacked inside each other. OK, so and we, of course, we want infinitely many of them stacked up, um, going up, 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 and down, 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 down forever. And then what we do then, was then, then we've effectively done is to is to fill the whole cylinder with cups, um, and each cup becomes very very close asymptotically to the asymptotically hugs the sides of the cylinder as we go up. Um, it goes up forever right, in the picture. Now what we we can do is we wrap this thing around by taking the cylinder, taking the infinite cylinder. Let's imagine sitting it on its side, and then what we do is we uh, we wrap it into a into a torus. Um, by taking two of these disks ends and uh, 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 wrapping them together so that they um, they glue together. And that way the cups actually meet into, go into each other. The cups are actually facing one another. It's a bit difficult to draw the picture. Um, the picture's really nicely drawn in the in the notes. But you have somehow inside the, the t solid torus, the solid interior of the torus in, in there, you have these little cups. And they are asymptotically hugging 
the the torus itself going asymptotically to it, but then there's another cup, and it's asymptotically um, hugging onto that torus, and so on, and they go something like this. Um, so this is what's called the Reeb uh, foliation. It's a foliation not of the torus, but of course of the so-called solid torus, the interior region inside the torus. It's inside uh, the the bounded uh, region of three-dimensional space bounded by the torus. So it's not in the torus. I'm not trying to draw these as curves. These are actually surfaces. They're their cups. And when we take this, this infinite cylinder, with solid filled full of cups, and we uh, take it and we bend it around itself so that a piece of it ties into another piece of it, the cups stack inside it, and they wind all the way around in here so that they sort of fill up, each one becoming uh, are very, very close to the sides as we go on. So that's a, our picture of the refoliation, and that's a very nice foliation, and of course it's given explicitly in the notes so you can really see what the foliation is. So, um, so this is a nice serious example of a foliation, and one which has a lot of structure to it. Let's move on and think about um, the the um, the problem of trying to glue these leaves together to see why this isn't the implicit function theorem. The theory of foliations is more complicated. Why um, the leaf space m mod foliation is the set of leaves of the foliation. Um, but that set is equipped with an obvious map. Um, we have a map, which is a quotient map, which associates to each point, uh, you, they associate the leaf that passes through that point. Because there's one, po one leaf through every point, right? Every point lies in a chart, in a foliated chart. Every point lies in some foliated chart in which it's identified with which is these, uh, that chart is, has these little plaques drawn on it. You take the plaque through and you take the leaf that goes that that plaque extends out to, so every point lies in in a in a leaf, and so there's a natural map um, from uh, points to to leaves. But in well, you can also put a topology on it. You put the quotient topology. Remember that's the topology in the in this quotient space for which its open sets are the ones whose Im inverse images are open. So um, so we can say U contained a set of leaves uh, is open if and only if, let's call this map pi, if and only if pi inverse u is open. So it passes through an open set of points. So a set of leaves is, is open when it passes through an open set of points. Okay, so that gives us the, the, um, the leaf space as a, as a topological space. Obviously one of the curious issues is wh how nice a topological space is it? Maybe it's Hausdorff, maybe not. Maybe it's uh, got some other nice properties. Maybe it's a manifold, maybe not. So. Um, when we try to understand the structure of the leaf space, the first thing we end up thinking about is the um, is the question of whether or not we can cut across the leaves. Um, so a local uh, complement S contained in M to a foliation, let's call it script F, um, is a submanifold um, embedded submanifold to be more specific. Um, uh, so that uh, tangent space at any point to the submanifold um, uh, plus a direct sum of that ten of the tangent space at that point to that leaf through that point is the tangent space at that point to the manifold. In other words, it splits. So here's the leaves of the foliation, and what we're looking at is a picture of trying to cut across them with some S so that it passes through them in such a way that it's tangent plane passes complementary to their tangent planes. So a, a local complement is a local section, is a local section if um, uh, it intersects, this S intersects each leaf at most once. Now in our picture, um, we sort of imagine that's what was happening. These were the leaves, and then this guy was cutting across them. But of course, it's possible that one leaf goes out and then flies off a way, a long way, a long way away, and comes back again, and then goes off a long way away, and then comes back again, and then goes off a long, long way, and comes back again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and, again, and it's all over the place. 
and so then we might not be able to make some s that would that would be a section we could only make a complement but not a section complements are easy you just take any any um, in local coordinates you just make the take the your p foliated chart and your complement can be anything going the other way not horizontally so to speak um, so that's easy the problem of making local sections really involves something global suppose we want to try and construct these things um, suppose we start off with uh, take a plaque so in some we have some foliated chart we take two points let's say y naught and y one on the do i want to be called y naught and y one i want to be called um uh, uh m sorry m naught and m one um m naught and m one uh, points on the same plaque uh, in so in some full in some uh, foliated chart they're in the same plaque um okay so So, um, so then, if we took um, little complements, um, so we have these points on the same plaque, and then we take um, here's the foliation. Then we take some complements um, to the foliation, which go say like this and like this. We could map complement to complement, at least inside this little chart by saying each point here gets mapped to the corresponding point here, point here, point here, depending on which which uh, plaque we're on. So we just take each all the plaques here which are parameterized by the by the complement, points of the complement, and we use them to parameterize points of the complement there. And that's called the holonomy um, between those two complements. The holonomy is the map, so here are points M naught, M1, and um, here are our complements. Take a point here with a given y value, slide it over here to this point with the same y value. So that's what we do when we have only two points and they're in the same plaque. What do we do if we have more points and maybe they're not in the same plaque? So if we now have um, points in the same leaf, so we have an M1 or an M0, and an M1, and an M2, and so on, and then we have some. Uh, foliated chart around this one, and then maybe a different foliated chart around that one, and so on and so forth. Um, then we have complements looking like this and like this. We follow our plaque along, along from a point here to a point here, giving a holonomy map, which takes points of this complement to points of this complement by following along like that. It's a bit tricky, though, when we take the next complement, um, some of these things may be no, no longer defined um, or may start to become defined. It, it's a bit tricky because, for example, in this picture, I could take maybe this guy, slide along its plaque, and hit that guy. And so inside this foliated um, chart domain, I'll have plaques that go along like that. Here I'll have these plaques. They don't necessarily meet up exactly because this one. Uh, is too high to go over this way. It can't cross the gap here and get across to this one. So they don't necessarily perfectly match up, but close enough to this uh, leaf, they will. If we have points very close to the leaf, then we know that um, they, uh, they will be able to slide all the way along here and then uh, go slide, sliding even further all the way along here to the next guy and so on. So while the, the holonomy um, map between these two plaques is defined by sliding along. Uh, sorry, but the holonomy map between these two complements is defined by sliding along plaques. Uh, the holonomy map between these three complements, from this one to this one to that one, becomes defined in some region around uh, this this point M naught. Somewhere around this M naught, you can map to somewhere around this M one. Somewhere around M one, you can map to somewhere around M two, and so on. So you may get smaller and smaller and smaller uh, domains for these these holonomy maps. So these are called holonomy this map holonomy and that's how you make holonomy between uh, two complements these two red guys here uh, when you picked out points to go between um, in in this particular uh, chart and then when you have another chart another chart another chart you compose holonomy 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 like that all the way along so let's imagine that we don't just have a leaf but imagine that we have inside the leaf we have a we have a path so we have a leaf so the leaf of our affiliation, and we have lots and lots of leaves, and um, and then um, inside that leaf, we're going to have a path. Um, 
which travels inside there, um, starting at some starting point p naught, traveling along and ending up at some final point q naught. And what we'll do is to um, make little uh, uh, choices of little uh, foliated uh, charts over and over and over and over till we get here. And then we can make choices of complements. Um, uh, Maybe a complement here, a complement here, and so on. All, all these various points along the along the way, um, so that we can go um, one by one by one, step by step, making holonomy. Now, at each step, we lose a little bit of the domain of the holonomy. It gets a bit worse and worse and worse because we follow along in our picture. We follow along a little plaque from this point to this point. Uh, well, a plaque that should be inside the same domain, so I should probably draw some extra points. Let's draw another one here in the overlap region so that we can make sure that this is well-defined. What are we doing? We've got another uh, complement here. We ride along our plaque until we get to a point here on the... Um, to a point here. Then we ride along the, the next uh, the plaque on the next uh, chart domain until we get to here. Then we ride along the next one to here and so on and so forth all the way along. Oh, gee, my camera's not really doing very well. Okay, so it's something like that. Um, so until we get all the way along. Um, so this is supposed to be the picture that table tells us what is holonomy. Holonomy is computed by this. Now, of course, in practice, it'd be very, very hard to do. But what we do is we take the chart domain, we slide along the plaque till we get to the next guy. Then we take our chart in our chart domain, we slide along a plaque till we get to the next one, and so on and so forth. And that way, we're sliding along always in the same leaf. And so we end up, we start off in this, this guy here, we end up over here. And again, at each step, we may have trouble that certain plaques may run off the edge and so we can't use them anymore but if we stay close enough to our we start with this with this path on on a single leaf stay close enough to that path and the plaques will be defined for a while even closer and it'll be defined for a little but further and so on so if since it's a compact uh, path from p naught to q naught along a leaf it'll be possible to make some small enough open sets in which these various charts are defined so that we can slide all the way along and produce a holonomy map from this uh, red guy uh, by step by step going from here to, he to here to here to here and so on all the way along until we get finally to here we get a holonomy map um, defined which takes some open set on this some open set around p naught on this red guy here to some open set around q naught on this red guy here that'll be our holonomy map it's going to take some complement at p naught, any choice of complement, this red thing here. It's going to take it to some complement at q naught. And again, as we go step by step by step by step, we have to replace this s p naught by a smaller open set, a smaller open set, a smaller open set at each finally many times, um, uh, because we run off the edge and some some of the plaques. Um, but in the end, we've got a well-defined, uh, well-defined map, uh, this holonomy map. Now, since the construction really depends only on plaques, not on, on actual um, the construction, so this leaf, the construction really depends only on the plaques. And the plaques really depend only on the foliation itself and the choice of open set in which we're working. The plaques don't actually really depend on the charts at all. The plaques are actually dependent only on the choices of open sets. So we take, uh, say, an adapted open set. Adapted, meaning... Um, Adapted open set is just defined to be a, a foliated chart domain. The domain of some foliated chart. Um, so we're allowed to use that. Then it really doesn't depend on the chart. The, the picture here really depends on the foliation because these are the leaves of the foliation intersecting this, this open set. And we're just asking that there should be some chart, uh, that, that adapted chart, uh, some foliated chart, which has this as, as its domain. It doesn't really matter what chart it is. All that matters is that we take the leaves, we look at how they intersect, and they intersect these little plaques, and we just ride along the plaques. So the, full, the, the, the holonomy is determined by, at each point of this red guy, you pick it, you slide along the plaque until you get to this red guy. And uh, so because we've made the, the, these little red guys small enough, each one intersects each plaque only once, although it may intersect a leaf many times because the plaque may go out and become the same leaf as one of these other plaques. Um, but it intersects each plaque once, and so, uh, so it's well-defined as a, the holonomy map is well-defined from here to here by this picture. And then by repeating the picture again, as we did up here, you can do it many, many, many times and get a, a holonomy map defined all the way along some path.
Now, I, I won't carry out the details of this. I'll just say the words, and these are actually exercises in the in the notes, that if you have not one path, but instead, uh, if you have on a leaf, if you have two paths, um, let's say from P0 to Q0, all on, they're on the same leaf. This is my leaf here. And I have I start to move that path. Uh, but I don't just have one path. Let's say we have infinitely many. They form a nice homotopy, right, a continuous family of paths that move from this path here over to this one here, continuously sweeping out so something like a surface going from this path to this path, always going, starting at P naught, always going to Q naught, but depending, continues on some parameter. We call that, of course, a homotopy. Um, uh, of paths with fixed endpoints. We fix the endpoints, P and Q, and that's a homotopy. And um, it's not hard to, to, to see by, by covering this thing with lots and lots and lots of overlapping little little um, adapted open sets that um, the holonomy is unchanged. Um, is not uh, altered uh, by uh, the homotopy of paths. Sorry, the words hol holonomy and homotopy are probably both homotopy, are probably both unfamiliar and sound a bit similar, um, but uh, holonomy of the path, in other words, what happens uh, along these red complements as you go, uh, as you try and match them up along, you just slide along plaques from one to the other, um, step by step by step, that doesn't really change if you use a little uh, a homotopy of the path, you start varying these paths. So we want to use the concept of, of, of the holonomy of a path. Um, we don't want to uh, work with it in a very serious way, but just um, use that idea to prove, um, to give at least an outline of a proof of, of, of a theorem that tells us when is a foliation coming from a submersion. We said if we had a submersion that we could um, locally, in local picture, make it look like some sort of shadow map, some linear submersion, some linear um, projection. And it would uh, then be possible then to take points in here and then look at their preimages up here, and uh, we'd get some kind of, of fibers over those points, which would actually be the leaves of some of some foliation. Um, so that means from a submersion we get a foliation, and what we want to know is wha how do we characterize that phenomenon? So foliation um, is associated to a submersion. Uh, if and only if its leaf space is Hausdorff, because this, after all, these are the leaves, and then that's the space of leaves. Each leaf is parameterized by a point down here, so that would be Hausdorff. So that's pretty clear. Um, uh, so one, its leaf space is Hausdorff, and two, um, it admits local section near each point. Okay, so that's the, the, the idea that if you had, again, this kind of picture um, of a submersion, this is some P, this is some Q, and we're going to map each point down upstairs to the point downstairs, then, of course, you'd have these um, as your your plaques, you'd have the premature point would be a plaque through the, I would, sorry, what, well, the plaque or, or just a leaf, the leaves through the point. Uh, you take points and you look at their preimages, their fibers, and that would give you the leaves. Um, and then you could make um, clearly you could make local sections by just um, we know that this thing has some coordinates. Say this has coordinates x and y, and this has coordinates x, in which this map is just x y goes to x. And so we could make these things um, be uh, be given by making uh, making y is constant. Right? These would be uh, y equals um, some y equals y not would be, uh, those would be our sections, local sections. Um, so so that would be giving us local sections. So you can see that they should exist in the case of a, of a submersion. So the, the other direction um, is the proof, uh, we wonder if we had, um, if we had uh, Hausdorff leaf space and we had local sections, could we make this work? So suppose we take uh, sections, um, local sections, some S M naught contained in our manifold. 
There's a manifold with some foliation, and uh, and then what we can do is to uh, is to take this s s equals s m naught uh, includes into m and then projects down into the uh, to the uh, leaf space. In the case of the foliation. Um, and um, for a local section, this map is one-to-one. -one. This composition map is one-to-one. -one. That's the definition of being a local section. Only it strikes each leaf once. Um, and uh, so now, if if this guy is Hausdorff, um, what you what what you can use is a theorem and topology, which I won't prove that a um, a proper injection um, to a Hausdorff. Let's see, to a Hausdorff, what do I want to say, uh, locally compact, packed uh, space, topological space, is um, a homeomorphism to its image. We've used that result before, and it's covered in lots of topology books, so we aren't certainly aren't going to be able to uh, prove that. But uh, S is covered in lots of little, it's a manifold, so it's got lots of little compact sets all over the place, each of which then uh, this applies to, so they become homeomorphically mapped to their images. And therefore S is homeomorphically mapped to its image. But that means the various little S's, um, each one is this section, so you have somehow, you'll have these leaves, and then you have this leaf space, and then you have this um, these sections. We have lots of them, we don't just have one. They all map to somehow down here to bijectively and then what you can do is just to is just to invert well, at least locally invert the map this way um, and that makes uh, makes this uh, this quotient space into locally pictures of these guys um, but if you to change the choice of which one you decide to identify you identify a piece of the leaf space you identify some chunk of it here with one with this guy then you decide to identify another chunk of it over here with this guy, then uh, the, the transition between those two is exactly the holonomy. So the, um, the, the holonomy map slides along the leaves from this guy to this guy, and so uh, the holonomy uh, is the transition map. And we know it's smooth. And so that um, that gives you that this guy is actually is a Hausdorff space. It's locally homeomorphic to a manifold, and it's uh, so hence the locally more homeomorphic to Euclidean space. And we've got smooth transition maps, and that's the the proof. At, at this point, the story is is extremely abstract because we've um, we've thought of it in terms of trying to um, to understand when some abstract um, foliation comes from abstract. Um, uh, um, Submersion, we'd really like to understand something a bit uh, more concrete where we could calculate some examples and see some things. So let's try to look at a kind of infinitesimal picture where we can do some calculus. Um, let's start off by thinking about, instead of thinking about uh, foliations by surfaces in three dimensional space, for example, let's think about a simpler thing. Suppose that at each point, in three-dimensional space, I have a plane in the just in the tangent space, so an infinitesimal picture. At that point, I have this plane, not in the whole manifold, not not as some some surface of the manifold, but just as a as, as a linear subspace in the tangent space. So, what does that look like? Let's just do three-dimensional space, uh, Euclidean space, for getting started. So, what we're going to be interested in is a plane field, uh, which means a choice of a plane at every point. Um, so. It's some plane, uh, let's call it P sub uh, x, y, z at each uh, point x, y, z uh, in three-dimensional space or some open subset in three-dimensional space. We'll just do the three-dimensional case first and then we'll try and talk about manifolds. Um, um, so uh, how do we write out a plane? We write it out as, as the solution of some linear equations. So it can be written out as, um, as the vectors that satisfy some kind of linear Linear equation. Um, so we could we could write these as the vectors. Um, let's say uh, p at each point x, y, z is the set of vectors v. Let's say with components a, b, c. I've already used x, y, z as my letters, so I have to at at a point a, x, y, z. I have to write my vector as some having some components a, b, c, and such that they satisfy some linear equation. Some f of x, y, z a plus g of x, y, z, b, plus h of x, y, 
is that c is 0. And we have to assume these, these, these get to be smoothly varying functions, of course. So f, g, and h will be smooth functions, and not all 0 anywhere. Because if they all vanished, it wouldn't be a plane anymore. It would be three-dimensional. So we want it to be a smoothly varying plane. So it's going to look something like this. It's going to begin by a linear equation um, with smoothly varying coefficients and not everywhere on zero on all the coefficients. Um, of course, we could rescale. We get the same plane if we rescale f, g, and h by some all together by the same non-zero function. But this is intuitively what we mean by something being a smoothly varying plane. And... Uh, so the picture is something like a picture of uh, of little planes through red throughout space. There's one at each point. So naturally, we might ask ourselves whether this is in fact somehow the tangent uh, plane to a foliation. Is there does there exist a, a foliation f so that um, p is the tangent spaces of the leaves of the leaves of the foliation? We say that f is the it, that, would, that would be said to be f is the tangent space or the tangent uh, yeah the tangent space of, of of f so that's what we mean by writing p is tangent is the tangent spaces of f it's all the tangent spaces of all the leaves of the foliation but how could we come up with an example that doesn't happen like that is everything maybe tangent to some foliation if you're given any p given by some equation like that can you can you decide whether or not there is some foliation that it's everywhere tangent to and what i want to do is i want to think in a picture like this imagine we have pieces of string hung out in space so we spread them out throughout space and on each one we make a little uh, plane but as we move the plane tilts more and more um, I'm not really good at drawing it, but the idea is supposed to be that it spirals around. We imagine that as we go along, it's sort of spiraling, and uh, so it's tilting. And then this plane is doing the same thing. It's it's supposed to be uh, tilting, and it gets tilted as we go this way. As we go this way, our plane is turning around, twisting around, and there are pictures, better pictures, of course, drawn in the notes, where somehow the plane is wanting to uh, to turn itself around, twisting around the wire. If you take a flat plane on this guy, and then you slowly turn the wire as you slide the plane along, it should rotate around. Um, and uh, so we have this plane that becomes more and more rotated as we go. Um, terrible pictures, but that's the idea, that it becomes more and more rotated. So they, it spins like, like a propeller. As you go along this way, along this wire, you keep the plane always, you hold the plane along, you slide it along the wire, and as you do, you twist the wire so that it turns around. Then we'd expect that there is no, um, and we do this for, for all lines, just not just lines beside each other, but lines up and down from each other throughout all of three-dimensional space. We'd expect there isn't any surface that's tangent to all of the lines because the surface, as we if it's going to be a tangent to this line, to these guys, it has to spin around as we go along this line. But it also has to spin around this way and this way and this way. So it has to sort of spin everywhere all the way along it. So it's not too surprising that there isn't such a surface. Um, so that's an intuitive notion that would prevent such a thing from happening. Now let's try and make this a bit more rigorous. Um, suppose that we had um, suppose we had um, a, uh, a plane field and um, we'll picture it um, as being again some uh, smoothly varying family of planes at the tangent spaces of three-dimensional space um, and um, and uh, so they're given by some again some p at x y z is given by some uh, it's the set of a b c vectors such that f of uh, well let's just say f a plus g b plus h c is zero um, where f is f of x, y, z, and so on are some smoothly varying functions. And just to make it easier, um, let's work in, a, in, in some region where one of these, uh, we know that at every point one of f, g, or h is supposed to be non-zero, otherwise this doesn't give us a, an equation cutting out a plane. Um, let's just uh, try and change the variables to assume that it's h that's non-zero near some point where we want to work. Um, so without loss of generality, since we're just going to do something very local, we can assume h is non-zero. And um, so we want to write it in some, in some simple way as um, some equation on this guy. Um, so, in fact, I think uh, following the notes, I'm going to change the sign. Let's make, uh, so let's make h uh, equal to minus 1 by rescaling. By rescaling f, g, and h together by anything I want, I can rescale by 
minus the reciprocal of h, I can make h equal to minus 1 uh, without loss of generality. Um, since there, since h is non-zero, this equation doesn't change if you rescale by 1 over h. It doesn't change if you scale by minus 1. So we can make h equal to minus 1. So that means our equation becomes fa plus gh. Well, we can put this over the other side. It becomes minus 1. So we put it on the other side, and we get c is fa plus g, uh, plus g, sorry, plus gb. So we get this equation that tells us how to find the, the third component from the first two components. That means exactly geometrically that our plane is maybe tilted, but it's not, um, it's not all the way vertical. A vertical plane um, would, uh, you wouldn't be able to solve for the z component of its vectors in terms of its x and y components. Um, it's the, this is the graph of z as a function of x and y, or let's say the c, com the third component, in terms of the first two components. So that means it, it's a non-vertical plane. So we have a collection of, of planes in, in some region of three-dimensional space, and they're not all vertical. So that means we can think of it as a picture where we have a, 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 an xy, act, xy plane, um, and then we have a, a z variable. And then at each point, we have a non-vertical plane um, in our picture, we have some non-vertical plane. At each point in the three-dimensional space, we've, we've drawn a non-vertical plane given by this sort of equation that f times its x component plus g times the y component has to be the z component. That's the equation of this little plane. But as, as we move from point to point, the plane is tilting and so, uh, move, moving around in some way. It's smoothly varying from point to point because f and g are smoothly varying functions. So it's a smoothly varying linear, one smoothly varying linear equation. Um, so now what we want to do is to say if we had a vector field down on the plane, so x equals x of x, y um, has some components, say a of x, y, d, d, x plus, uh, sorry, I'm off the camera. Um, so if we had some vector field on the plane, uh, it's given by capital X is, uh, depending on x, y, only in the plane, it has a, an x component, a y component. Um, then we could lift it up to three-dimensional space uniquely as a solution of our equation. So we take this vector field down the plane, and we associate to it a three-dimensional vector field on th in three-dimensional space. We'll define its lift, its hat, to be um, simply a the same x component and the same y component, but a z component that satisfies our equation. Our equation was that the z component should be f times the x component f of x, y, z times the x component plus, um, let's see, plus, I need to a little more room here, okay, plus um, g of x, y, z times the y component, d, dz. So this means that we have a pl an, an any vector field at all in the plane, and then we lift it upstairs to a vector field that lies inside our um, this is our x hat in three-dimensional space. So x hat lives in three-dimensional space. It's a vector field in three-dimensional space that lies tangent to our to our planes of this plane field P. So we have a smoothly varying family of planes, and we've arranged that for any vector field in the plane, we can lift it to a vector field upstairs so that the lifted vector field, this vector here, projects down to this one. And uh, when we project our variables from 3 to 2, we project this vector x hat to this vector x, and x hat lies tangent to our planes. So there's a unique way to do that. It's given by exactly this expression here. You take any vector field in two variables, you promote it to one in three variables, but you have to satisfy the equation that the third component, the z component, has to be f a plus g b for the a and b, the first two components. OK, so that gives us a way to lift vector fields. Now, if you were to, to look at the flows of those vector fields, the flows are given by solving the differential equations associated to the vector fields. Um, the, in other words, the, the vector field upstairs uh, has, well, let's say downstairs, uh, it has some a d d x, so our a is, of course, a of x, y, and it has some b d d y, b is b of x, y, and so the differential equation that moves a point x, y is x dot y dot, uh, the flow equation of the flow of this vector field, is x dot y dot is a, b, again, of x, y. Um, the, the, the guy upstairs has the equation um, a, d, d, x plus b, d, d, y, again, the same, uh, the same requirements that a is a of x, y, b is b of x, y, 
plus, we said that it had to be um, F uh, A plus G B D D Z, where now F is F of X, Y, Z is the three dimensional, the function of three variables. G is G of X, Y, Z is a function of three variables. And the A and the B are the same ones we had before. Um, but that means that the flow equation for this guy is almost the same equation. It's x dot y dot z dot equals uh, a b. Again, a is a of x, y, b is b of x, y. And then this last guy here is f a plus g b. So the flow equation is exactly the same in x and y. It just has a, a z component. And that has the consequence, therefore, that when you reduce variables from three variables down to two variables, by dropping the third variable, by just forgetting the z variable. If you drop the z variable, you get exactly the differential equation you had up here. In other words, it means that the flow lines uh, map to the flow lines. So flow lines of x hat map to those of x of x hat map to those of x by uh, dropping the third variable, dropping the z variable. Okay, so now we can see how to take a vector field downstairs to a vector field upstairs in such a way that the flows map ex exactly one to one. Um, they match perfectly. Okay, so now what if this was uh, was tangent? How does this, this relate to tangency to affiliation? What we want to consider is the is the possibility that there might actually be some kind of surfaces along which these things these things live. So. Um, so we have this, this three-dimensional picture. Um, again, we have this three-dimensional picture, which looks something like just dropping a variable. Um, we have a z variable, an x and a y. And, um, and we have this x hat vector field, which, uh, which is tangent to our guy here. Um, and we have, of course, and we have down, downstairs here some x vector field, capital X. This is capital X hat. Um, uh, so um, in particular, um, since flows match to flows, if we take two vector fields, let's suppose we take a capital X and a capital Y vector field, and for simplicity, we can take it to be the standard basis or anything we like. So we could just take this to be a DDX and Y to be DDY, for example. It doesn't matter. Any two vector fields will do. Then they lift to some X hat and some Y hat. Now, um, uh, the and the flow maps to, to the flow. Um, now, if um, if x hat and y hat uh, are tangent to a foliation by surfaces, then uh, we must have that um, uh, that they uh, the, the, so is uh, so is the bracket. Why is that true? Um, because uh, they'll, their flow lines will flow along the surface. If they're tangent to the surface, then they flow along the surface. Right? You have some surface and you have some vector field tangent to it, and its flow lines just flow along the surface. So, um, so if x and y are tangent to a foliation, so is x, y. And so, um, so x, y um, is then somehow also in, also um, in the plane field which is the tangent space to the foliation. So if there's a foliation by surfaces and this p is just the tangent to the, the tangent to the foliation, tangent to the foliation, then um, then it must be the case that the brackets of uh, tangent fields uh, to the surfaces uh, of the foliation are tangent as well. And so we get this uh, uh, simple fact um, by being tangent to the foliation. But then um, we have that bracket of x and y um, uh, must map under the projection mapping. We make the projection mapping, which takes a point x, y, z to x, y. We've done that mapping already. We forget the third component. Uh, this guy, uh, well, this projection mapping takes x to x, x hat to x, uh, it takes y hat to y. And so it must take the bracket of x and y hat to the bracket of x and y some because the flows match. Because the brackets are determined by the flows. And if the vector fields are matched, their flows are matched. But if their flows are matched, you differentiate the flows and you get that the brackets are matched. So the brackets are matched. Um, but this bracket was 0 because we chose, we decided to choose this guy to be just ddx 
and this guy to be ddy, and so their brackets are zero. So these have zero bracket. So this is zero. It's a zero bracket. And so this guy is mapped to zero. So this bracket's mapped to zero, um, but it has to belong to the to the plane field. It's in the plane field, and the plane field is mapped. Um, we've said it's not vertical, that planes are not vertical. So when you project them down to the flat horizontal plane, they don't go to zero. Nothing goes to zero. This is one to one. And so if it goes to zero downstairs, it must have been zero upstairs. And so um, bracket of x, y is zero as well. They have to, they have to bracket. And so what we discover is that, um, is the basic fact that um, if you have uh, tangents to affiliation, uh, then their brackets have to be, these brackets have to be zero. These, these guys have to, if, they're, if the brackets downstairs is zero, the brackets upstairs are zero. Um, so this gives us some criterion for deciding if some plane field is tangent to affiliation. What you do is you calculate these, these vector fields and you bracket them and see if you get zero. Uh, this argument wouldn't go through if you weren't tangent to affiliation. Part of it would, but, um, but this part wouldn't because we said tangent to affiliation by services forces the bracket to be tangent to the services. And that's where we got this from. So what would happen if they weren't tangent to affiliation is simply that you'd have some vertical component to the bracket. This bracket would have a vertical component. Now we can try and sum all this up in a, in a, in a relatively simple way um, by saying that um, that um, if we have tangent to tangent to affiliation, if uh, some plane field is uh, is tangent to some affiliation, uh, then um, uh, if we have any vector fields which we can think of as our x hat and our y hat uh, tangent to p, there in other words, they lie in p at every point, that it would imply that their bracket would also be tangent to p. And that's the, 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 the basic result. If these vector fields are everywhere tangent to the leaves of affiliation, they form vector fields on the leaves of that affiliation. Their bracket is a bracket uh, is, is a vector field on the leaves. And again, that's because brackets are calculated by flows. If these guys tangent to the leaves of affiliation, then uh, they flow along the leaves. And so their bracket is computed by looking at flows along the leaves, and so it's also along the leaves. So we can generalize this um, to all dimensions. So if we have some uh, p contained in the tangent spaces of M, uh, is we say it is a plane field. Um, it's also known by most often by other names, um, also known as uh, as a sometimes called a distribution, which is confusing because the word's used for lots of other things. Um, uh, if uh, uh, it's a subset of the tangent bundle of the tangent planes of the manifold, in other words, so it's some p uh, at every point m not contained in the tangent space at m not um, is a, a vector subspace, a linear subspace, and we want to make sure it's smoothly varying, so it's spanned um, by some um, it has some basis of vector fields. Uh, vector fields, some x1 to xk on m, linearly independent, um, so that p m0 is exactly there, um, well, linear independent every point, is exactly the span of the x1 of m0, xk of m0. Um, well, let's say m, uh, what do I want to say, m1, maybe m1, m1 for all, um, at every point, m1 for all, m1 near m0. So in other words, I'm saying a smoothly varying plane field, it should be, to be smoothly varying means I should be able to write down two, two vector fields if it's two-dimensional in such a way that it's, it's just given by they form a basis at every point of the, at every one of the planes. Um, so that's the picture I want to think of, that I can pick vector fields and they form a basis for the, for the, um, they form a basis for this system of, 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 of linear subspaces, these planes. So really when I said plane, they're really not strictly speaking planes, a plane field really could be in this case, k-dimensional subspace, linear subspace at each point varying in a smooth way because it's given by k vectors, which can be made to smoothly vary to, 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 um, 
to smoothly vary as we go along. So we don't want our, 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 our subspace P to, to suddenly uh, switch to being in some discontinuous manner to, to switch its direction. Um, so we've insisted there be, should be smooth vector fields. They should be smooth, of course, smooth vector fields um, that span the guy at each point. And so as you move around, it's always the same. It's always this uh, span by these these x's, at least in some some open set. And then you might have to use different x's on some other open set, and so on. A, a section of v, um, section of uh, let's say of p, is a is a vector field x with uh, x at each point in that linear subspace for every point in M. So it's called a section of the uh, the vector of the of the uh, plane field. So an integral manifold of the plane field is um, is a sub manifold. Uh, so that it's tangent uh, to the plane field. In other words, that its tangent planes lie inside the the, the planes of the plane field, and and with with the uh, sorry, not not just lying inside, but actually, I mean, I want to say that an integral manifold S should have the, the property that its tangent plane at every point S is exactly P M. Um, okay, so that's my integral manifolds. Um, let's see if I can draw a picture. If we just want to draw a little picture, um, we'd have the simplest case of a plane field would be a line field. You'd have a, each point, you'd have a little line, and um, sometimes called a slope field or something like that. And what we'd imagine for an integral uh, manifold would be that somehow we'd follow through, we'd make a curve that follows through those lines, so that every point it's a tangent to those lines. So that's given by just solving an ODE. So um, a plane field uh, P is a bracket closed. So to be bracket closed, um, if um, the bracket of sections is a section for all x, y sections. So in other words, if x and y are tangent everywhere to this plane, so lie inside these planes, so you have this p with x and a y uh, that lie inside there everywhere, then uh, then you can bracket them and you stay inside there. Um, okay, so that's the the definition, and we've already seen that um, that uh, p uh, tangent to a tangent to a foliation, if it's the tangent vectors to a, to the to the leaves of a foliation, that implies that it's bracket closed, because uh, vector fields tangent to the leaves, their brackets are tangent to the leaves because they are computed by by going flowing along the leaves. So now we can state the Frobenius theorem, which is a very very fundamental theorem. Um, uh, which is that a um, uh, plane field P uh, is bracket closed uh, if and only if uh, P is the tangent to some foliation, some uh, foliation F. Um, uh, and this, uh, this happens. Uh, if and only if it has uh, has an integral manifold through each point through each point um, so those are the and those turn out to be of course the leaves of the foliation so it has to have leaves so it has to have, they have to exist and then on the other hand if there are such things then they turn out to be the leaves of a foliation um the 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 proof is 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 really one we've already effectively given um we make many variables instead of one variable z and then instead of our x's and y's we make many variables down here um so we had previously we had written this as a picture with a z and some x and some y but now replace it by many variables this way and some many variables that way um and then we make vector fields depending on, let's suppose these are vector fields are x1, x2, and so on and so forth. This is some, I don't know, y1, y2, and so on and so forth. So we take vector fields that only depend on the, um, uh, let's say, x1, dt, x1, dot, 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 only on the x's, right? And, uh, and then we lift them to vector fields 
which are allowed to depend on the x's and the y's, yi, ddyi. Um, we, we lift them just as we did before um, so that they have to be tangent to the to the plane field. We have to make sure that, that we can choose our x's and y's so that at least locally in some little piece of the plane field it's actually given by um, the little the little planes are, are, are not not vertical. Um, I don't have any 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 um, vertical directions uh, lying in them. And you can do that with using, using linear algebra at one point and then by continuity it'll hold all the nearby points. So we'd use the same lifting process, which we did before, and then the proof goes through exactly the same way. It shows that if you, um, if it's not bracket closed, then you, you don't get any integral manifolds. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, that if you have these integral manifolds, that's exactly what we said, that, uh, that the flows of the, the lifted vector fields, the x hats, when you bracket them against each other, they're flowing along the integral manifolds. And so, um, so their brackets must also flow along those integral manifolds. Um, and so you get uh, bracket closure of P. Um, so that means if there is a, such a foliation, you get bracket closure. Or if, even if they're just integral manifolds, you get this bracket closure. But on the other hand, once you have the bracket closure, then, uh, then you can construct uh, the foliation by actually uh, constructing those integral manifolds. We'll be a bit more clear about that. If you, um, if you had... Um, bracket closure, what you could do is to lift uh, commuting vector fields just like we did in our previous example. We said we could uh, take a downstairs on the on this space. We could take the vector fields, which are the ddx1, the dot, dot ddx, however many there are, um, and we could take each of them and make their lifts uh, ddx1 lifted ddxp, just as we did in the previous case. Uh, we lifted the vector fields to vector fields upstairs and details of the linear algebra are in the notes. So, um, so but then these, these vector fields commuting um, uh, will force these ones to commute um, because uh, their brackets have to match the brackets. Um, the brackets have to match with brackets and, the, and they have to be tangent to the, since it's bracket closed, it'd be tangent, the brackets have to be tangent to this guy, but then again, that's a linear isomorphism down to here. So the brackets have to be zero because um, the brackets of these guys are zero. So you get bracket matching, you get these guys having to have zero brackets, and so they commute, and then you can use the simultaneous uh, flow box theorem. So we've got the brackets of these guys. Um, again, why do they, does it have to be zero? Well, it has to be something in the plane field but has to project to zero because these guys have zero brackets, and the brackets have to project to the brackets because these guys are lifts of these guys, so their flows match up. So it's the same argument again as we did in the x, y, z variables in three dimensions. We can do it now in any number of dimensions, and we get uh, by the simultaneous flow box theorem because these brackets are all zero, we get that there exist coordinates in which there are in fact uh, actually um, just some sort of horizontal. Um, uh, just some vector fields of some coordinates. And um, so it's possible to, en then to make the foliation in those coordinates. We use a simultaneous flow box theorem to make these guys into coordinate vector fields, at least locally, and those coordinates are the ones that give us uh, exactly our foliated chart. So as, as, as an example, to make this a little more concrete, um, let's see if we can figure out how to calculate um, these things in a, in a simple case. We take x to be... Um, dd, let's say y ddx minus x ddy, and y is z ddy plus y ddz. We can calculate out the bracket. Um, these are vector fields on, on a three-dimensional space with the usual coordinates x, y, z. There are two of them. You can calculate out the bracket, and you can work out, I won't do it for you, the world is, 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 is that it is a linear combination. Of x and y, except on certain at most points, uh, most points of uh, most points, uh, uh, not everywhere, but on some open set, some dense open set in R three, which I'll let you to calculate. Out. I'll leave you to calculate out what the bracket is of those two vector fields, and then um, that means, therefore, that on most of the points, there, there, these are linearly independent. They're not linearly independent everywhere, but um, they're linearly independent on an open set. 
and some open set. And it's on that open set where their bracket is a multiple of them. Um, so you can actually calculate out what that open set is, where these are linearly dependent. And then um, you actually get, um, by the Frobenius theorem, you get some foliation by, um, by integral manifolds. In other words, that this x and this y vector field are pushing around on surfaces inside three-dimensional space. So there's it's just little x, little y, little z variables that they're written in. And somehow there are these surfaces which these vector fields are actually pushing around along. And uh, and and so it, 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 the space is mostly filled up by those. There are some points where they're linear dependent and then it doesn't work, but other than those points, it works everywhere. And if you examine more carefully what those, what those surfaces are, they're actually spheres around the origin. Um, you can see that because these were our rotation vector fields that rotated around the origin, spheres around the origin. And so you can actually compute out what these, what these surfaces are. You can compute out the foliation. And of course, it's not very well behaved at the origin. But you can check it and you can see that it, that it actually does satisfy the conditions of this Frobenius theorem, that the bracket of x and y is, is a linear combination of x and y um, at typical points. And at those typical points, the theorem tells you that there are these surfaces that x and y are everywhere tangent to. Next time, we'll apply this machinery of the Frobenius theorem to the Lie groups that we've been working on to see if we can construct subgroups.